behind that we all are the same. <laughs> Yet other folks just wear their jeans When they're listening to jazz in New Orleans You better bring your music To be sure you don't have to go when you're You're out of style if you have no time It's the latest fashion when you're in Shanghai Welcome to the stage, ITRON's Vice President of Global Marketing and Public Affairs, Sherilyn Moore. Go, go. Go. Well, good morning. We had some credible opening, didn't we? Special round of applause for the Los Angeles County School of Arts and their vocal jazz ensemble. Thank you. Yesterday we spoke a bit about resourceful innovation. Today we're going to take a slightly different turn on it, but maybe first let's do a quick recap. What did we think of learning about innovation and hard and soft trends from Daniel Burris to get our minds going in the morning? How was that? Good? You like that? 
I heard a lot of buzz, a lot of talk about it. And then I heard there were some really great sessions later in the day. Did everybody find something that they learned yesterday in their sessions? Give me a round if you did. Good. And then last night at our party, I first of all, I really apologize. It was hot. Um, wow, it was warm. But um, it looked like everybody did their best to ignore it and have a great time. So did everyone have fun? Yes? You know, I can't be sure, but I think maybe that was really Jack Nicholson, and he just does this for kicks. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. Okay, so let's transition in today's program. Uh, it's not accidental that we brought in this incredibly talented high school group to open us up uh, today. We want to talk a little bit for a moment before we get into our keynote about powering the next generation. Daniel Burris talked to us a little bit about hard and soft trends, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Uh, first question, when we look at our utilities and we look at our utility industry, is it a hard or is it a soft trend that we have an aging workforce and we're going to have a knowledge gap as people retire over the, the coming years? Is that hard or soft trend? Hard. We know that technology is going to become increasingly important in utilities uh, across everything we do. Will the complexity increase or decrease in what we do in an industry? Hard or soft trend? Complexity increasing. Hard trend? What about the talk about there being a shortage in talent? That we don't have the jobs or the talent to, to backfill the knowledge gap? Is that a hard or soft trend? I heard it, soft trend. So we're going to talk a little bit today. You know, ITRON is passionate about working with you in the utility industry. And one of the things that we've tackled this last year is how can we contribute in a way uh, to engage that next workforce, to get excited about the work that we do every day, to get involved in the innovations we were talking about yesterday. And so ITRON's worked on a curriculum uh, partnered um, with the University of Texas, Austin, specifically with Dr. Michael Weber and his team, uh, to build an application, a digital, exciting, interesting curriculum that educates high school students about energy water issues in STEM curriculum that gets them intrigued and excited, uh, as, as excited about what we do uh, to get them intrigued enough to maybe they want to come work in our industry. We envision this as a curriculum that we may be able to use to partner with you as a utility to use in your local communities. It's something that ITRON's employees really cares about. This is a lot of where this started. ITRON employees said, we want to educate kids about this uh, topic of energy and water and getting people involved. So ITRON employees in the local communities where we have presence in U.S. but outside of U.S., it's something we can work in our local communities and help. Uh, inspire the youth to get involved in energy and water. So we're excited about it. Uh, but to talk a little bit more about it, it's only appropriate if I bring my partner in crime here, Dr. Michael Weber to the stage. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, good morning, everyone. We got the 8 a.m. shift, I guess, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is it's over early. Yeah, it's over. You'll be done soon. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, you were here a few years ago, so many in the room might remember, but I think it's appropriate if you remind everybody the things that you do or maybe the things you don't do. Sure. Okay. Do we'll talk a little bit of that. So my name is Michael Weber, and it's nice to meet all of you. And I'm, I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And I have a chance to work with some of the world's greatest engineering students because UT Austin has a really good engineering program. And it's really an honor to work with those students. And some of the subjects we work on are energy and water and the interconnections of them and what they mean for society and the world. And we have this mission there to train them to be the next generation of energy and water leaders. And so we do that in a multidisciplinary way with uh, policy and markets and economics as well as the engineering. Engineering is not enough, but it's a big part of it. So I work with students and I help run the Energy Institute there and I help run the Clean Energy Incubator. So I do work at the intersection of commercial commercialization, policy, research, and education, all on these topics that we care a lot about. And two years ago, I spoke on the stage on the Energy Water Nexus, which uh, was, a, for some of you, perhaps an introduction to it. You might have heard about it or thought about it, but it was a way to talk about it because it's something ITRON deals with a lot. And a lot of you in the audience will care about these issues from different perspectives. So it's good to be back and be part of this conversation. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah. Why do you feel that energy water, in particular energy water issues, are important 
and why do you think our next generation get involved in that? Why is that your cause? That's a good question. So in my view, the Michael Weber view, energy and water are the two most important ingredients for a successful modern civilization. That without energy and water, we don't have the other parts we need. Yeah. Um, and the, the way I think of it is energy is wealth and water is life. Without water, we don't have life. Without energy, we don't have the quality of life we want or the wealth and the affluence. And so they're the important ingredients we need to make everything better. And this is an idea I've had for a while and I thought about it. And I discovered a few years ago that there's this famous Nobel laureate, a man named Rick Smalley. Some of you might have heard about him. He won the Nobel Prize almost 20 years ago to the day right now in physics for discovering the buckyball C60, carbon 60, this geodesic dome, Buckminster Fullerene. He discovered that molecule and then was this Nobel laureate, very distinguished gentleman. He spent the last few years of his life, he died a decade ago, unfortunately, the last few years of his life while he was diagnosed with cancer, giving speeches about the most important challenges for humanity, the top 10 challenges. And he listed them in order, starting with what he thought the top challenge was, energy. Number two is water. Number three is food. Then you get to things like the environment and poverty and terrorism and war and, and democracy is actually further down the list. The idea being that energy and water at the top because if you solve the energy problem, then you can solve our water problem. If we have abundant, clean, available, accessible energy, all our water problems are solved because we can desalt the oceans or pump water farther or treat it better or store it. And if we have all that energy and water, then all our food problems are solved because we need energy for the fertilizers and diesel tractors and for the refrigeration of the food and then the water to irrigate. And then once you solve energy, water, food, you can solve the other problems down the list. So he had a very thoughtful logic for how to tackle society's problems, energy, and water at the top. And so that's a way to think about why it's important for us. If we can't figure that out, the stakes are high. There are unfortunately plenty of examples over the last few thousand years where societies collapsed because they had a water constraint. We think of the Mayans who collapsed mm -hmm. in uh, South America or the Tang Dynasty in China. There are different places where a really large dynasties collapsed because they didn't have water. So that's something like the stakes are high for society and for civilization. So what you're saying is it's important. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, also, uh, I'm also trying to scare you uh, and uh, you, you, know, you should be doom and gloom. But uh, we're, we're really hopeful and optimistic. I know Itron's optimistic about it. I'm optimistic. The stakes are high, but these are solvable problems. Yes. With the, right, with the right people and the right yeah. talent and the right technologies and the right approaches, solvable problems. That's the way I think about it. Well, you bring up approaches, and I think that was one of the things that I learned the most about is curriculum is changing. Um, the old textbook might be going away, and kids are, don't have the attention span. Wasn't it talked about yesterday? Daniel Burroughs says they're bored. Kids are bored when they go into schools and they're taught the old way. So I think uh, the curriculum that we put together tries to address that. Do you yeah, want to exciting. tell everybody a little bit yeah. about that? So, so I have the greatest job in the world. I get to work with brilliant yeah. students, and I get yeah. to learn from them. They think yeah. they're learning from me, but actually I'm learning from them. And the way they learn changes with time, and they, they get smarter over time. And I, I have these like funny stories where some people are, are uh, pessimistic about the future of education and students, but I'm very optimistic because I see these great students. I think, well, thank goodness they're going to solve our problems because they have what it takes. They think the environment and climate change, energy, water, or it's their cold war and they're going to solve it. And they're a very values-driven generation. I have students who leave with a bachelor's degree in engineering who are 22. They're offered a, a job for $90,000 a year and they turn it down to work at a company whose values match theirs that half the pay. So they're a values-driven generation. They're thinking a lot about these issues. They learn differently. They're actually better students in many ways. I, I have students who come into my office sometimes, and uh, energy and water are hot. So I have students come in and say, I want to work on that topic. It's a hot topic. I'll do anything to work with you in your group, Dr. Weber. I'm like, well, OK, well, what kind of grades do you have? And that kind of thing. Like, well, I've got a, a 3.8 GPA or some great GPA. And I, I start like, well, Weber students have better GPA than that. So it's kind of this funny thing. Of course, I laugh because I never would make it into my own group because my grades are nowhere near that good. <laughs> so this is, this is like the funny irony I have. I'm just laughing. Like, the students are better today than when I was a student. And when I came through, we weren't as good. We weren't as dedicated to society. We weren't as values driven. And we learned differently. These students are better. They're more dedicated. They're driven a different way. And they learn in a more interactive way. They're digital natives. And I found that flat textbooks, the traditional in classroom instruction, doesn't work for them the same way. They're drawn to our more interactivity. And so we had the opportunity a couple years ago to do an online course, a MOOC, a massive open online course, Energy 101, that went across the world. We had 44,000 people from around the world sign up for this course, which is really phenomenal. That is scale that you can get with digital technologies. And it was interactive, and there were media, and there were all these things going on with it. It was great. And during that process of building that course, I had two people on my team who were really brilliant who helped advise me through this. One is a 21-year-old at the time, or 20-year-old student who's brilliant, named Coleman Tharp, who's in here somewhere, actually. I had a chance to work with this genius wonder kid student at where he is who taught me a lot about education. Another guy, Juan Garcia, who's here also, who has 15 years of educational technology and interactive experience around education. And I took what they know about advanced technologies and digital learning and what I knew about the subject on energy. We made this online course. And then in 2014, we made it an app 
for iPads. We wrote a textbook to go with it with a lot of interactive features, dozens of games and true-false slider games and maps and that kind of thing. And we did it mostly just for fun, to help me teach my class. And then it, it got adopted. People found it, said that's good. High school started to buy it, and university started to buy it. And then we thought, wait, this is a new way to go about education. The flat textbook is dead. We need Harry Potter textbooks, textbooks that come alive, like the movies and that kind of thing. So we are going to this interactive approach, and we're getting good feedback that it's more natural for the kids. If you've got kids, they're on the iPad already. You know them. They're texting instead of doing their chores, probably. So they're uh, already naturally engaged this way. And we think this new approach, with interactive apps, it gets us to them in the language that they're learning, and they makes it easier to learn, it's more fun to learn, they're learning more, and the feedback's really positive. We're pretty excited about it. So we think it's working, we're getting some traction. It's very cool. Yeah. Go ahead. It's exciting to be part of it. So what do you think we can accomplish with it? So if we, if we do this together and we make it available, what do you think can happen? Yeah, so the idea, you make a good curriculum on energy and water, you make it available for K through 12, there's millions of students in K through 12, boy, would that be a home run. And I think the, the place to start is with uh, the kids in high school who are taking physics or environmental science. You start there, people are already inclined towards some of the technical subjects and get them some new material. And if you do this the right way and you roll it out, you get thousands and thousands of students who get access to information they wouldn't have had before, access to learning. These are your potential hires. Like this is your pipeline of talent you talked about. Getting them groomed up to think this is interesting, to think utilities are not dinosaurs, but actually very innovative and forward looking, and that the energy and water distribution systems and all the technology goes into it is a place to be. I think that's where we'll get. And so the home run for us is getting access to a lot of those students who have the interest in those topics, give them better uh, materials, better curriculum that they can learn from, that they can take with them for life. And my hope is that we make a measurable effect on STEM education nationally and perhaps internationally. You've got the international platform. Let's go internationally. Let's make people more resource conscious, and that's good for the environment. That's good for our long-term prospects. Let's make them better students. That's better for all of us. We all benefit from students who are better. They're already more naturally talented, probably, than we are in many ways, so there's a lot of gift to work with. It's just a different tool. So I'm pretty optimistic that we'll have pretty big reach with it. And uh, we'll start in the United States, but there's no reason why this isn't global or we won't go international with it. Taking it all the way. Take it all the way, yeah. I really do see a model where it, there's potential where really good curriculum is in high demand. Uh, school districts need that, and I think the public-private partnership here may be the model of the future, and I think we're getting in early. It might, it might be. I mean, the, the, the textbook model, the industry um, is a slow-moving industry, and the textbooks that my kids read are the same textbooks I read, although they added more color figures or something. So it's basically the same information. And there are some industries or sectors where that pace of updating the textbooks is too slow. Uh, we were joking the other day, we learned about in petroleum engineering, their drilling engineering class uses the same textbook from the 1980s, which misses all the 30 years of innovation like hydraulic fracturing, stuff like that. That happens in a lot of fields. So the, I feel like the materials are behind the times. And getting materials to be more updatable and, and, and relevant is a way to go. And the feedback, from, I, I did tests with my kids, like our own little focus group at home in the Weber household, and uh, even my third grader liked it, so I thought that was a good test. <laughs> so we can, we can keep his attention, because he's all, all YouTube all the time or something like that, or uh, these online games and that kind of thing. So, uh, so I think it's a big opportunity for sure. What do you think if we maybe give everybody a preview? Yeah, let's, uh, we should do that, yeah. Well, you know what? If you're uh, sitting in the audience, this is a little bit, um, if you've seen the Ellen DeGeneres or the Oprah Book Club at a, at a very iTron relative level, <laughs> we're providing a free giveaway today. Pull up at this end of your chair, and there's a card in front of you. We're providing uh, the first chapter that's complete um, on this gift card to all of you. If, if you were a recipient of a very special gold gift card, the golden ticket, raise your hand because that you actually received not only the curriculum but an I, or Kindle Fire. Raise I think he also gets a tour of the Willy Wonka chocolate factory or something. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. We'll give you a Kindle Fire to go along with your new curriculum. Uh, but take that. You don't need to download it right away. I think when everybody jumps online at the exact same time in here, we run into some bandwidth that's used. But via the QR code, uh, you go to the App Store and, and download the first chapter of the curriculum. We're working to complete it together. It should be available, um, what, second quarter? Yeah, we think next it'll year. be done May. In May 2016, we'll have the curriculum done. It'll be available for schools in that fall. Then we're yes. shooting for the next fall. There are already schools we know in the AP Environmental Sciences and other classes where they're really interested in this topic. Yeah. So we're starting to prepare for next fall. 
So it'll be ready in May. And you get this preview. It's available for seven days, so download it, check it out, let, let us know what you think. And then, uh, and then we're going to be building the rest of the curriculum out. And you'll see some preview of what the other chapters will be with the table of contents. And you'll see the first chapter. You'll see some of the interactive features. There's some slider games. There's embedded media. There's different video clips. There's a map, a scroll you can slide through. So it's, it's like a book, but you can really engage with it. And we hope you like it. And this is just a sneak peek of what we've what's coming and, and what we think will be relevant for you or your kids or your community. And I guess that's part of it is a community part, right? So ITRON employees are going to be taking this out to schools where they are volunteers or where their kids are enrolled. And so this would be an opportunity for a lot of your partners as well to yeah. roll this out. Absolutely. We, we envision working with our utility clients that if you as utilities want to have some access to license of the same curriculum to work in your communities, we'd be happy to work with you on that as well. So. More to come, but as Michael said, uh, take a look at it and provide feedback to us. We'd love your input, and uh, we'll keep you posted on the progress. That's great. All yeah. right. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, Carolyn. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to our keynote speaker today, and I'm having a little bit of opportunity on a couple pre-calls as well as this morning, and she is a riot. So I'm not sure if I've got a stand-up comedian coming up here or a motivational speaker, but either way, I'm thrilled to have her. Um, that was off script. Let me go back to script. Okay, Kelly McDonald is a marketing and advertising expert and considered one of the nation's top experts in multicultural marketing and consumer trends. Her client experience includes brands such as Toyota, State Farm, Nike, Harley Davidson, Miller Coors, and Sherwin Williams. She's been featured on CNBC, in Forbes, Business Week, Fast Company, CNN Money, and Sirius Radio, Sirius XM Radio. She's the author of two books. Her first, How to Market to People Not Like You, was number seven on the best-selling business books of 2011. And her latest book is titled, Crafting the Customer Experience for People Not Like You. Please welcome to the stage, Kelly McDonald. Hi. Wasn't that choir great, and Sherilyn's comments great, and Michael Weber's comments great? I'm so excited because it's kind of all weaving together for me to talk about my favorite topic, and should be yours too, which is crafting the customer experience for people not like you. And let me start, start by explaining what I mean by customer. I think if you work, you have a customer. So your customers in the utility industry are obviously the communities that you serve. But internally, if you're the accountant, at a utility, then maybe the customer that you serve is your entire enterprise. Um, your customer can be your boss. Your customer can be your fellow associates. And your customer can be the future workforce. So as we talk about innovation and the future workforce, one of the things that kind of comes together for me is that all of these are about serving and growing your business and serving your communities. So you can't serve your communities, you can't serve your customers, if you don't understand them, and if you're not keeping pace with how they're changing. And customers today are more different than ever before. So we're going to talk about how do you craft the customer experience for people not like you. Now, we've all heard the expression that America is a melting pot. We've all heard that. America's a melting pot. Well, we're actually not a melting pot anymore, and we're never going to be a melting pot again. We are a salad bowl. Let me explain. America's a melting pot is an expression that was coined in the early 1900s to describe what was happening to the United States relative to immigration. We had a huge wave of immigrants from all over the world, but particularly from Europe. Ireland, Italy, Poland, Germany, many of your ancestors and mine came through Ellis Island, got processed as new arrivals, and the idea was that no matter who you were, where you were from, we threw you into one pot, and we simmered away the differences because we didn't value diversity, we valued sameness, and everybody kind of came out the same, Americanized. One culture, one homogenous society, speaking one language. Well, today, most organizations, business, and society in general recognize that diversity is a progressive mindset. We don't all have to look the same, dress the same, be the same, or come from the same backgrounds, especially to contribute to work. So when you look at a salad, there's not one single element of a salad that can be mistaken for anything else. The tomato does not look like the radish. 
The radish does not look like the cucumber, and the cucumber does not look like the avocado, and so on. Every element of a salad is distinctive and can be seen for what it is. And most of us would agree that the more and different stuff you put into a salad, the better the salad gets. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, diversity though, I don't actually like the word diversity. I don't use the D word. I like to use people not like you. And the reason for that is because I find that in my experience, when I say the D word diversity, people tend to think racial and ethnic diversity. And that's super important, and we're gonna talk about that, but I don't think that's the only way that we can be diverse. I believe that if you are different from me in any meaningful way, then we are different, that is diversity. Ma'am, you, do you have children? You have children, I don't. We could be the same age, we could be the same race, we can be the same gender, we could live in the same zip code and make the same household income. And by all of these demographic standards, she and I would look the same on paper. But you know and I know that if you've got kids and I don't, we're gonna be different in every meaningful way, right? You're gonna make decisions differently than I do, you're gonna have different priorities and pressures, and that has nothing to do with race or ethnicity, it has simply to do with parenthood. Right? So again, my definition of diversity is any way you can be different from me. So here's my list. It's not source. This is Kelly Science. Your list could be different. Right? Gender. Men are different from women. We really are. I mean, there's comedians who make their entire living riffing off of this, but it really is true. Women use something like 20,000 more words a day than men. <laughs> my husband's like, for you, it's 60,000, Kelly. You know. <laughs> By the way, Apparently I was going on and on and on about my day one time in excruciating detail and he'd apparently had enough and he goes like this to me. <laughs> Dudes, if you're in a relationship with a woman, do not do that, okay? He slept on the couch for two weeks. All right, so we are, aside from the fact that we are more verbal, women are also more demonstrative than men. We're much more likely to hug and kiss and express our emotions and wear our heart on our sleeve. It's not hard to figure out what mood a woman is in. What about religious differences? That's a way that we can be different. Political views. The debate is tonight, right? Yes, the second debate. Age and generational differences. There's no doubt that somebody who's Gen Y is very different than someone who's a boomer and so forth. The gay and lesbian market. Physical abilities, emotional abilities, mental abilities. Rural versus metro. And you guys would know about this in the utility business, right? Someone who lives in a loft in Manhattan is very different than someone who lives on a ranch, and so are the utilities that serve this. Military civilian. There's two totally different worlds. And the five races. Folks, there are only five races. Everybody on the planet falls into one of these five. White, black, Asian, Native American, and Pacific Islander. Everything else is an ethnicity. So for example, if you are Hispanic, that's not a race, that's, that's an ethnicity. Or if you are Indian from India, then your race is Asian, but your ethnicity is Indian. What about nativity? I think somebody who's foreign born would look at the United States and the world with a very different lens than someone who's US born. Life stage, a new mom or a new dad is in a totally different place than a retiree or a college student or an empty nester. Lifestyle and affluence, of course. The poor are very different from the middle class who are different from the wealthy. And even core values. You know, if you homeschool your child, you're very different than someone who does not, right? Or if you take your plastic bottle of water when you're finished drinking it and you toss it into the recycling bin, that tells me something about you. Tells me something about your values. Maybe you're just trying to do, trying to just do your part. You know, you're just going to throw it into the recycling bin versus the trash. Maybe that tells me a little bit about you. So this list goes on and on. I was doing this presentation one time, and this woman yells out from the audience. I guess she thought it was an interactive exercise or something. And she said, I got one for your list. And I said, what's that? And she goes, pet owners. I'm like, totally. Pet owners are very different than non-pet owners. So then some guy yells out, he goes, I got one for your list. I said, what's that? And he goes, gun owners. I'm like, oh, totally. I mean, the list, go <laughs> the list goes on and on, but I think you get the idea. So how do you understand someone who is different from you? The only lens that you have to look out at the world and see the world and interpret the world is your lens. You don't know what it's like to be somebody else. I will never know what it's like to be a guy I don't yet know what it's like to be 80 years old. I don't know what it's like to be black, Hispanic, Asian, or Native American. I don't know what it's like to be a mom. I don't know what it's like to be in the military. And I don't know what it's like to live on a farm. These are things I don't know. But I promise you that that does not mean that I couldn't meaningfully connect with somebody who is those things or has those things. Right? How do you connect with somebody who's not like you? It's about understanding that what makes you you is your priorities, 
your values, Michael Weber talked about this, and the experiences that define you. That's what makes you you. And all of this is what shapes perspective. Perspective is never wrong. Your perspective is never wrong. Her perspective is never wrong. His perspective is never wrong. His perspective, mine, nobody's perspective is ever wrong. It's how you see the world. Now, I might respectfully disagree with your perspective, and I might even offer you a different perspective to consider, but I can't tell you that you're wrong. It's like your opinion. You're entitled to hold any opinion you want. So just to show you how different perspective can be, try this exercise sometime. When asked the exact same question, people will have totally different answers based on their perspective. When asked to name how Kennedy died, matures and baby boomers are likely to say a gunshot wound in Dallas, right? Gen X will say a plane crash near Martha's Vineyard. And Gen Y will say Kennedy who? <laughs> no, that's not fair to the wires. I'm sorry, just a little levity. Try this one. Who is Ron Howard, right? If you are of a certain generation, you are going to say Opie. Matures, right? If you're a baby boomer like me, you're likely to say Richie from Happy Days. And if you are Gen X or Gen Y, then you are likely to say an award-winning director. You see, everybody knows who Ron Howard is. The only thing that changes is the way that we know him, the perspective, the context. And he's all of these things. None of these are right or wrong. He's all of these things. So. Connecting with someone who's not like you, here's how you do it. I'm going to talk about all of these things, about giving people what they need, about relieving pain, and then I'm going to wrap it up with five ways that you can deepen the customer experience. People need what they need. And like perspective, their needs are never wrong. You can't roll your eyes at them and think it's stupid that they need what they need. I mean, you can, but that's not going to be serving your customer very effectively or your associate. People need what they need, and they will gravitate to the places that they get it. Even the largest companies know this, and they tweak. They tweak their product and service offerings just a little bit to give people what they need. Macy's is the largest department store that we have in the United States. Even Macy's tweaks their product offerings to give people what they need. In Salt Lake City at Macy's, you will find a larger selection of large, oversized cookware than any other stores. Why? because Salt Lake City is home to the largest Mormon population in the United States. And a key tenet of Mormonism is larger family sizes, and another key tenet of Mormonism is eating family meals together. So if you have a family of six or a family of eight, it's going to be a whole lot easier to make scrambled eggs in a large oversized skillet than it is in a small one and make a mess. In Atlanta, which is home to one of the largest African-American populations in the United States and one of the most devout church-going populations in the United States, you will find a larger selection of women's clothing in white and women's church hats, because many African-American women choose to wear white to church and church hats. So while Macy's sells church hats at every store, you're going to find a better and larger selection of them in Atlanta. Burger King even adjust their menu. I have to give you an aside here. I did a keynote for Burger King and their, all their franchisees about two months ago. They loved the fact that my last name is McDonald. <laughs> Seriously, they, these guys were like cracking themselves up. They're like, oh, we got Kelly McDonald giving our keynote. Ah. <laughs> Burger King humor, yeah, anyway. <laughs> So I'm listening, the president of Burger King is, you know, is going on for you know, 10 or 15 minutes before I get up there, and I'm, I'm taking interest in this. By the way, their two for five dollar chicken sandwich is not going to go anywhere. Apparently that's their loss leader. They make a lot of money on that. But what they do do is they adjust their menu to give people what they need, even in a, in a business that is all about mass, right? Fast food is all about mass. Make it and get it out the door as fast as possible. In New York, their breakfast uh, sandwich is served on bagels, whereas in Birmingham, it's served on biscuits. So even the largest companies understand that people need what they need, and they tweak their products and services. But sometimes it's not the what. It's not church hats or oversized cookware or biscuits. Sometimes it's the how. My 76-year-old mother loves to go to the bank, <laughs> right? Or in, this, in your world, maybe would love to go pay her bill at a utility in person, right? She loves that. That makes her feel confident. She doesn't want to do that on an app. She doesn't even have a smartphone. And even if she did have a smartphone, that would make her uncomfortable. She'd be like, how do you know it went through, right? Somebody who's 25 years old would see no reason whatsoever to actually do any of that kind of stuff in person. It'd be like, why can't I manage all of that online? You can't tell my 76-year-old mother that she's wrong and that she's got to 
that, she, that she's got to do this online. And you can't tell somebody who's 25 that they got to go in and pay a bill in person if they don't have to. People need what they need. But sometimes that how, the how you do it, is actually more personal than the what. So public storage payment options. You guys know what I mean by public storage, right? You, you stick your stuff in public storage. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this. I used to. I used to be like, how many of you have a public storage unit? And people would be like, is she going to put me on hoarders? You know. <laughs> so this is one of, the, one of those weird industries that you don't ever pay any attention to until you have to. So I did a, a keynote for their industry. And they tell me that they've got three primary kinds of customers. The first kind of customer is probably someone just like you or me. We got too much stuff. We're not ready to get rid of it. We stick it in storage. If they love us, OK? If you put your stuff in storage, they have you for the rest of your natural life. No, I'm not kidding. Their research shows they have you for the rest of your life. You would rather eat ground glass on a Saturday than go clean out your storage unit, OK? Seriously, you will happily pay that bill. It's just out of sight, out of mind. They love that, OK? If they can get you to put your stuff in there, they've got you as a customer for life. The second kind of customer that they have is typically the young person who has fallen on hard times. Maybe they've gotten a divorce, lost a job, lost a home, had to move back home with mom and dad. But it's temporary. They're going to get back on their feet. So they don't want to sell all their stuff. They just want to put it in storage for a while until they get back on their feet. And the third kind of person that they have is the military professional who is deployed. So there's a really smart guy in El Paso who has a public storage unit, and El Paso is also a military base. And he figured out that what this guy needs or this woman needs, the military professional, is an electronic funds transfer on the first of the month for 60 bucks. This person has way bigger fish to fry overseas than to worry about whether the bills at home are getting paid. Let's make it as easy as possible on that person. EFT, 60 bucks at the first of the month. But maybe that kid who's broke and who's living at home with their parents, maybe coming up with 60 bucks on the first of the month is tough. Maybe it would be easier to pay $15 every Friday. So yeah, it's a little bit more work, but what a great way to say, I see you, I get you, I understand what you need, and we're here for you, giving people exactly what they need. And this has nothing to do with marketing or even the product. The product is the same. It's a public storage unit. It's the way they're sort of frosting the cake for that customer. So let's talk about relieving pain. Unless you're into 50 shades of gray and all that, most of us actually try to avoid pain. We will go to enormous lengths to avoid pain, and we will gravitate to the businesses, services, and organizations that make things painless for us. The problem is people's pain points are different. So for example, women want security and great personal service. Now, I'm not suggesting that men don't, but women place extremely high premium on this. So have you ever had a chip in your windshield? in your car and, and you call one of those windshield repair places, they will come to your home or office and repair it. So that's a great service, right? You don't have to lift a finger, they will come to you. Well, the problem is Safe Light Auto found that women, and particularly single women, were extremely uncomfortable with the idea of some strange dude coming to their house or apartment. Because now this guy knows where I live, and now he knows I live alone. So the very thing that is a service becomes an anxiety point. He knows where I live, and he knows I live alone. And again, I'm, not, this, I'm doing this presentation a couple weeks ago, and a woman yells out from the audience. She goes, yeah, and they show up in a big, white, scary van. <laughs> Never thought about that. That's how people get abducted, right? That's the perspective, right? So this very thing is a, this, uh, there's a service is also an anxiety and a pain point. So they're not going to change their business, but what they did was say, all right, you know what? You make an appointment with Safe Flight Auto. We're going to email you a photo of the technician and tell you what time he or she is going to be there. So now you've got a picture of Robert, and you know that he's going to be there between 2 and 5, and now he's not so scary. I know what he looks like. I know what time to expect him. OK. Takes a little, some of the pain away. Men, men hate ironing, OK? Did you know this? <laughs> this guy's like, totally. <laughs> the problem is you come to a conference like this, you've got to look OK, right? You can't look like you slept in your clothes. So Omni Hotels found that men would go to extraordinary lengths to avoid ironing. They would do almost anything to avoid busting out the iron. All right? They will buy a new shirt in the city that they travel to. They will steam their clothing in the shower for 45 minutes trying to get the wrinkles out. Anything. Any. Who's clapping? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's like, validation. Yay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> So they're, they're, what they decided was, OK, if that's a pain point for men, let's take the pain away. Instead of doing a frequent guest program where you rack up 500 points here and 500 points there, and then you redeem them for a free night, 
Who cares? Wouldn't we rather give somebody free pressing of two garments? Where's applause, dude? There, there, yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right, so yeah, he's on his app right now booking a room. Yeah. So clearly this is uh, the kind of perk that can be enjoyed by anybody. I've taken advantage of this, but it was a pain point that they identified that was for men. So how do you know where the pain points are? Ask people. You would be amazed what people will tell you if you just ask. They will tell you almost anything you want to know if you just ask. It's just that most of us don't ask. And then the other thing that you want to do is absolutely work with your frontline people and get their feedback. So let's talk a little bit about asking people for what we need to know. There's this concept called pilot fish. Now, once I learned about this, it was kind of mind-blowing. Pilot fish, the idea is that scientists have studied fish and schools of fish, and they see a whole school of fish swimming, and there's millions of them, hundreds of thousands of them, whatever. And they're swimming, 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 and then they turn, right? And they all turn on a dime together at the exact moment. It's not like some of them are over here going rogue and they're going to catch up, right? They all work together. So the, fish, the scientists have gone, how do they know to turn? Who's communicating and how do fish communicate? And what they've identified is invisible to the human eye usually is that at the front of that school of fish, there is in fact a pilot fish. There is one fish who's in charge. That fish is the leader and everybody else in that school is a follower. So that fish goes, hey, we're going to go left. And everybody goes. The correlation to human nature is that anytime you get a group of three people together or more, so three people at that table, People at this table, people in your workout group, people in your work uh, project groups, people in your church group, people in, you know, whatever. Any group of three people or more, one person will emerge as the pilot fish. They are an influencer. They are an opinion leader. They may not even know they're a pilot fish. It's not like they're walking around going, I'm so influential, right? Yeah, but they just kind of take charge. So case in point, I mean, we've all been here where we've been standing around with people trying to figure out where to go for lunch. And we're like, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Are you craving anything? No, I don't know, man. I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. What do you want to do? And finally, somebody goes, can we just go out for Mexican? Let's go. And everybody goes, OK, great. And we all go. Somebody had to take charge. Pilot fish moment. The point is you're surrounded by pilot fish. Your coworkers, your associates, your suppliers, your customers, all of them can be pilot fish, 360 degrees all the way around you. You know who they are. If you think about it, you know who they are. They're those people who are just, they're kind of influential. They're kind of opinion leaders. Talk to them. Just talk to them and say, what do I need to know? What aggravates you about doing business with us or our systems? What do you love? They'll tell you if you ask. They're not just going to come to you and offer this up. But if you open the door to that conversation, they will walk in that door. The other thing that you got to do is you have to enlist the help of your frontline people. Your frontline people hear everything. They hear absolutely everything. I do a lot of traveling. I'm on the road about 150 days a year, and I stay everywhere. And I was recently in upstate New York, and I was somewhere between Albany and Syracuse. And if you've ever been there, there's not a whole lot between Albany and Syracuse. So my client put me at what they probably thought was like the nicest hotel in the area, except it was more like a converted Victorian house that was more like a B&B. &B. So clearly not set up for business travel. I mean, there's like no Wi-Fi. There's no desk in the room. I'm sure it would have been a charming little hotel for a romantic weekend, but I don't care. You know, I don't, I'm not a diva. I don't care. I just want clean and comfortable. But it was incredibly dim in this room. There were only two little lamps by the side of the, by the, side of the bed, two little lamps. It was so dim that I was actually trying to read in bed that night, and I actually had my flashlight app on my phone trying to read. And I dragged the ironing board into the bathroom the next morning, which was the only place I could get enough overhead lighting to see what I was doing to press my clothes. Again, I don't care. I'm just laying out the story. So the next day, I'm done. I'm done. I'm walking out. I'm checked out. I got my rolly bag. I am 10 feet from the door. I'm done. I'm walking out. And I go rolling past the front desk. Very nice woman at the front desk goes, thank you. How was your stay? And without thinking, I guess my filter wasn't in place. I was like, it was OK. Thanks. And you know and I know that when somebody goes, it was OK, it's not really OK. At, at best, it's kind of eh, you know? It's not bad enough to complain about, but it's not, not great. She's smart enough to pick up on this. And she goes, oh, it was just OK? Was there anything wrong? And I said, no, no, no. No, no, nothing was wrong. She asked, right? If, I wasn't going to say anything. But if she's asking, I'm going to tell her. So I said, no, 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 nothing was wrong. The room was clean and comfortable, and that's all I care about. But I got to tell you. 
That is the dimmest room I've ever been in in my life. I mean, there's just the two little lamps by the side of the bed with probably a 25-watt bulb in each, and it was just really dim. I had to actually, you know, use my flashlight app on my phone to read in bed. It was just really, really dim. And she said, yeah, we hear that a lot. <laughs> well, then fix it. <laughs> my point is this. I bet she does hear it a lot. She's at the front desk. I'll bet she hears everything. I'll bet the person who needs to hear it, who is her boss, doesn't ever hear it. So if I was her boss, I'd be soliciting this information. I'd be going to her and saying, Susan, you talk to more people every single week than anyone else here. You're checking them in, you're checking them out. What are you hearing? I want to know. Because I know and you know that we're not afraid of the problems that we know about. We're afraid of the ones we don't know about. And that would be her opportunity to say, well, people do love the hotel. It's charming, but they complain about the lighting. You know, it's a very special kind of employee who's just going to bring you problems or issues like that. You've got to pull it out of them, and it's not that scary hard to do. Enlist your frontline people. Ask them what they're hearing. They hear everything. So five ways to deepen the customer experience. The first way is tap into values. Michael Weber talked about this. I couldn't agree more. I'll tell you this. If I can figure out what you value, I can figure out how to get into your heart, your mind, and your wallet because people spend money on what they value. So here's some things that people value these days. Everybody values this. Local business and green and environmentally friendly. Right? So no matter what your utility is doing, you are a local business that is providing local jobs, local opportunities, especially for the future workforce. And if you're going green in any way, which in the utility industry is a hot, hot, hot commodity, of course you're going green, then talk about that because people care about that. Here's some other things that people value. Millennials, right, 18 to 35, they want to know that the organizations that, they're, uh, that they are doing business with are improving society. And again, I just refer back to uh, Michael Weber's comment about walking away from a $90,000 a year job and taking one for half the, the, the salary because you agree with the values of that organization and what it's doing and its purpose and its vision. 92% of millennial women say that they want to do business with an organization that supports a cause. Almost any kind of cause, but you got to stand for something. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, save the environment or Susan G. Coleman race for the cure. Just, you know, and you are all doing this. You're all the good guys. You just need to let people know. A couple of uh, quick, quick women's values. Women want testimonials and customer reviews online. Fun fact. Women spend more time researching online than any other consumer group. More than blacks, more than whites, more than Gen X, more than Gen Y, more than men. Any way you can slice and dice consumers, women spend more time online researching something that interests them than anybody else. So they want testimonials and customer reviews, and specifically one of the things that carries a lot of weight is what other women say. It's kind of weird because we put a lot of stock in what other women say even if we don't know those women. I, don't, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I am a woman, and it still doesn't even make any sense to me, but it's true. If I'm on Macy's.com, and I'm going to buy a bedspread, and I'm about to hit, you know, order that, and all of a sudden I click on the customer reviews, and I see that Jennifer B. in Minneapolis said that she didn't like the bedspread <laughs> because the blue wasn't quite as pictured when she got it. I'm not buying that thing. <laughs> Jennifer B. in Minneapolis has my back. Yeah. A couple of other uh, broad sweeping generalizations about women's values. Women value expansive choices and seeing all of our options. We are not overwhelmed by lots of options. It's kind of the opposite, folks. We're empowered. I can look at 175 different colors of blouses, and I can tell you without hesitation that I want the tangerine one. And I know I want the tangerine one because I looked at all 175, and that's the one I want. I'm 100% confident in my decision. Men, on the other hand, <laughs> Men want their choices simplified. I'm sorry, you guys, but there is a reason why your clothes only come in three colors. <laughs> Black, navy, khaki. Look at you. <laughs> yeah, sir. Ladies, just to digress for a moment, how awesome would it be to be a guy for just one day and stand in front of your closet and go, oh, I don't know, what's it going to be? <gasps> Black, navy, or khaki? How do I decide? So easy for you guys. <laughs> And so here's the deal. I mean, I'm making a joke about it, but the magic number for men is three, and this is not Kelly science. This is real science. The magic number for men is three. Two is not enough choice. Four is way too much. <laughs> Don't overwhelm a guy, right? <laughs> so if I say to you right there, you, sir, chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry? 
chocolate, he can choose. I may not have mentioned his favorite flavor. Maybe his favorite flavor is mint chocolate chip or butter pecan, but if I just give him three choices, he can choose. Try another one. Blonde, brunette, or redhead? Careful. <laughs> Fun fact, men buy more electronics than any other consumer group. More than women, more than blacks, more than whites, more than Gen X, any way you can slice and dice. Men buy more electronics than any other consumer group. More flat screens, more tablets, more phones, more cameras, you name it. More accessories for all of their electronics. Haven't you ever noticed that when you go shopping for electronics, and you will pay attention to this on Black Friday, you may not remember me, but you're gonna, you're gonna go, that blonde lady talked about this and this is true. Haven't you ever noticed that when you go shopping for electronics, all of the consumer pricing is done in groups of three? Even stuff that's not electronics but is heavily targeted to men, like tires. It's all done in groups of three. Why? Because it works. So here's how you use this information. If you are working with a woman, whether she's a customer or whether it's your boss or whatever, then you would say, here's all the different ways that we can do this. There's all these different options. There's all these different ways. Here's all the different proposals that we got. I want to review them with you. And with the guy, you would say, here's our three best proposals. Here's our three best options. Here's our three best-selling products. Here's our three most popular payment plans, whatever. If a guy wants more information, he'll always ask for more. But you'd be amazed how far you can get when you just do that. Give people what they want. And be the good guys. And I know you are the good guys, but you got to be the good guys and you got to let people know and demonstrate and market your social consciousness. And I know you're doing all of this, right? Whether you're doing a blood drive at your utility, you know, once a year, or planting trees by the side of the road, educational efforts and outreach for the next future workforce, and scholarships, all of those types of things. You're doing all this kind of stuff. You guys know what you do. Just make sure you market it. People want to know that you are, in fact, the good guys. You have to foster a culture of empathy, too. If you're going to create a great customer experience for people not like you, then one of the things that you're going to be very dependent on is empathic employees. And empathic employees have very specific uh, characteristics. You want to hire the right kind of person, not just the resume. Now, obviously, if you need a CFO, you need a CFO in those very specific jobs. But many of us have teachable jobs where we could teach somebody the right kind of job if we had the right kind of person. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather teach you the job than find the person who's got the skills and hope I get the right kind of person. Because I can't teach you to be resourceful. I can't teach you to have good judgment. I can't teach you to be you know, resilient. These are things that you just are. So don't be afraid to recruit from new ponds. Let's say you go and you buy a shirt, and the person who's waiting on you at the store is amazing. What's wrong with handing him your business card and saying, you know, I really like your approach. If you ever want to make a change, I'd love to talk to you. You're not promising anything. You're not promising a job. You're just simply saying, I would love to talk to you. The reason that you want to do this is because when you look at the future workforce, understand that awesome people are awesome everywhere. They are not selectively awesome. They are not awesome on Monday and they suck on Thursday. They bring their awesomeness every day. That's who they are. You want to hire awesome people. And awesome people are awesome everywhere. And when you encounter awesome people, understand that one of the things that makes them awesome is the very specific characteristics that they have, like being attuned to subtleties. This is my barista at Starbucks. Her name is Brianna Ridgemore. She is so awesome that I actually featured here in a little vignette, a little anecdote in my book. And we were talking about giving people what they need and what they want, and she's agreeing with me. She's like, oh, I know, it's so important. And not to be dismissive, but I'm thinking to myself, she makes cups of coffee. How different can it be? And I asked her about that, not in that way, but I was like, tell me. And she was like, oh my gosh, I've got a story for you about you know, giving people what they want. She was like, this guy came in, and she's telling me this story, but we all know this guy. He's everywhere. He's at every Starbucks, OK? He's like, he finds himself very attractive, OK? He's Mr. Hotshot. He's on his phone. He's Mr. Important, blah, 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 blah. Now, any reasonable person who's on their phone when they go up to the Starbucks counter would say, hang on a second put the phone down and order. That's what a reasonable person would do. But no, not this guy, because he's Mr. Hotshot. Blah, 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 blah. Goes up to the counter and starts pointing at the board. Right? Yeah? And so Brianna's like, really? That's how this is going to go. She's thinking this, right? She's trying to figure out what he wants. He starts pointing. 
And so he, she figures out that he wants a macchiato, right? So then she's like, two can play this game. So she's like, He lands on medium grande, right? And then she's like, all right. No. All right. Do you want whipped cream? He says no. OK? All of this is going down without a word, right? So she figures out, without a word, that this guy wants a grande macchiato with no whipped cream. The whole time she's making his drink, she's thinking, jerk, 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 jerk. Really? You know, really. And she's just hating on this guy, OK? She's making his drink, gives it to him, and then he tips her fat. And she's like, Next day he comes in, dude is still on the phone. <laughs> he is. The whole thing starts all over again. He starts pointing. She's like, oh, for the love of God. OK, so you know, she lay him. Here we go again. We go through this. He lands on a grande macchiato. She's like, whipped cream? No, he doesn't want whipped cream. Boom, he tips her fat. By the third day, you don't forget a guy like this by day three. Right? By the third day, the guy comes in, still on the phone. OK? But by now, she's got it down. They don't even have to go through their little charade. She just kind of looks at him, and she's like, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> tips are fat. She said, what I came to believe, she goes, I don't understand what this guy does for a living. I don't know. Maybe he's on the phone with Bangladesh every morning with a conference call. I don't know. She goes, but what I came to believe is, you know, I, I started off thinking he was the biggest jerk. And what I've understood now is that I don't know what this guy does for a living. But what he is paying me for and what he's tipping me fat for isn't a cup of coffee. It is speed and efficiency. I let this guy come in here, and I get him his drink, and we never, ever even talk. He does not have to break his stride. That's what he's tipping her fat for, is not coffee, but speed and efficiency. Now, that little old lady who comes in in the afternoon, she doesn't want speed and efficiency, right? She wants companionship. She's lonely. She wants somebody to talk to. And Brianna is so attuned to subtlety that she's like, I try to give that lady everything that she needs to. I try to talk to her and give her as much attention between customers as I possibly can. That is an awesome employee. And she makes cups of coffee for a living, but she is so attuned to her customers that she is giving people what they need. The other thing about employees is that they're gracious under every circumstance. Um, they see the person, not the, uh, not the customer. Halloween, you guys know those temporary Halloween stores that are around right now? They're in these grungy shopping centers. You know what I'm talking about? They pop up for 60 days, and then they go away. Here's another one of those weird industries that you don't pay any attention to until you have to. So I go and speak at their conference. And you, you, know, you, you think it's hard to find good people in your industry? Now imagine you're in the temporary Halloween business. <laughs> you're not even in the retail business for Christmas where you can give people jobs for four months. You've got about eight weeks to make your money, folks, and then they're done. Seriously, then they're done. They're from September to November 1st. They have eight weeks to make all of their money for the whole year. All right, so there's a great deal of pressure on them. Imagine the kind of great people that they need. But you know, how you, know, you know who you get when you only can offer a retail job to somebody for eight weeks? You get meth heads. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. They will tell you in their industry that that is the biggest problem they're having. They get like drifter people, you know? People who like, they only need a job for a couple weeks, then they don't show up or whatever. So personnel is their number one issue in this industry, and yet their business is so dependent because it's so compressed on personnel. So I go to their conference, and I'm at their cocktail party, and I'm talking to you know, managers of these stores and stuff. And one woman is telling me about this woman that she has a, a, an employee. And she said, I am so grateful to this employee, because she is amazing. She is so empathic. She said, she told me a story about a very, 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 very large woman who came into the store with her heart set on being Spider-Man for a party. So, the associate takes the woman into the dressing room, sets her up with the Spider-Man outfit, and the associate is standing outside the dressing room door doing what they do, and they're like, how you doing in there? You need anything? And the woman comes out, and she looks something like this. Right? Now, obviously, that is not a real picture of this situation because there's a bookcase behind her, but I just want to show you the power of Google Images. Because when you go to Google Images and you type in large woman in Spider-Man outfit, this is what you get. Everything is available to you in terms of images. It's astonishing. Anything, no matter how obscure. So anyway, she looks something like this, except she is not rocking this kind of body confidence. She's the opposite. She feels incredibly self-conscious. And she's standing there, and she says to the employee, I look terrible. And the employee, without missing a beat, said, actually, you look awesome. But didn't you say you were going to a party? And the woman said, well, yes, I am. And she said, I don't know about you. 
But my very definition of having fun at a party is being able to relax and enjoy myself and be comfortable. And I can't have fun if I'm not comfortable. And you have chosen probably the most uncomfortable costume that we have. It's like being wrapped in saran wrap all night. It's hot, it's confining, it's sweaty. Have you thought about being a geisha? And the woman said, no, tell me about the geisha outfit. And she said, oh my gosh, it's so awesome. You get to wear slippers, you get to wear the long flowing gown, you get to be more comfortable. So she never made it about appearance, she made the solution about comfort. Furthermore, the geisha, the, the, the Spider-Man outfit is a $50 costume and the geisha outfit is $200. <laughs> the other thing is that empathic employees and great employees are never defensive when things go wrong. And things go wrong all the time. We're human beings, we screw up. Things go wrong. Anybody here like ever remodel any part of their home in any way? Are you ever going to do that again? Yeah, I just went through a kitchen and bathroom model. It was the most painful thing ever. I'm never moving. Um, and everything, if you've ever gone through this, then you know that things always go wrong, and things take longer, and they cost more. I mean, it just, it's not a smooth process. I had the world's greatest contractor on my job, though, because every single issue that I brought to his attention, everything that went wrong, he said the only five words that I care about hearing and the only ones that your customers ever care about hearing, and that is, we'll take care of it. Because you know what? This is going to sound harsh, but nobody cares what your problems are. You care. You should. Your boss cares. They should. But the customer doesn't care what your problems are. They're your problems. I don't care that your server went down. I don't care that the tile guy is caught in a snowstorm outside of Denver. Not my problem. Take care of it. And then obviously, if you're going to say those words, you've got to do it. But that's what people really care about. Also, pay attention to trends. And again, both Sherilyn and Michael talked about trends. I couldn't agree more. Pay attention to trends, but not fads. Sherilyn uh, encapsulated it as hard trends, soft trends. I, I encapsulated it as trends versus fads. The difference between a fad and a trend is fads come and go. Trends don't come and go. Trends are shifts. Pay attention to trends. Um, so for example, social is everything. And you guys know this, and I'm not talking about social media, duh, we're way past that. I'm talking about our desire to stay socially connected. Is there anything that is less social than doing business with a vending machine? No. You go up, you put your money in, you press a button, it dispenses something. Right? Well, Pepsi's trying to change that with the Pepsi social vending unit. I don't know if you've seen this. You go up, you put your money in, you swipe, you know, I press my diet Pepsi, and then it says, would you like to send your friend a drink? <gasps> yeah. I totally want to send my friend a drink. Oh my gosh, what a great idea. You, what's your name? What? Mike? Seriously, Mike? Awesome. I was going to say I'm going to call you Mike, but I'm going to call you Mike. All right, so Mike and I are friends. You know what? Mike is having a tough week. He could use, he could use a little love. I'm going to send him a drink, let him know his friend Kelly is thinking about him. And because we're friends, I've got his number in my phone, right? So I go up, I put two bucks more in the machine. I put Mike's phone number into the machine, and shazam, Boom, he gets a text message under the table that says, hi, Mike, Kelly bought you a gift. Use this code to redeem at the nearest Pepsi social vending unit. How cool is that? Now, we've done something that is inhuman and unsocial and made it fun for both of us. It's fun for me, because I was just going to go get myself a drink, and now I get to do this cool thing for my friend Mike. It's fun for Mike, because he's going to be sitting in some boring utility meeting somewhere, and he's going to get a cool text under the table that says, Kelly got you a drink. Mike, I'm waiting for them to come up with the margarita machine. That is going to be our machine, right? All right, what about this one? Again, think about fads versus trends. Pay attention to trends, but not fads. I want you to envision the umbrella that you have in your car. Think about the shape of that umbrella when it's open. The umbrella design hasn't changed in hundreds of years because it hasn't had to. It's perfect the way it is. How many products can you think of that being the case for where the design hasn't changed? The umbrella design hasn't changed until now. Now we have this. What do you need that for so that you can do this? Because right? Lord knows we are not going to stop texting just because it's raining. Right? I got to send this text to Sherilyn and it's pouring and I got to hold this phone and I got to hold the, you know, it's tough. Right? So here is a product that has been redesigned for us because of our desire to stay socially connected at all times. Here's another one. Selfie sticks. I know. Dorkiest thing ever, right? Until you get one. Really, I got one as a gag gift last year uh, from, from some friends. Best gag gift ever. I use it all the time. Here's the thing. So quick selfie 101. 
If you want to make yourself look hideous in a selfie, then just do this. Hold that phone down here, OK? You're going to have 30 chins, right? You're going to live, like, look like some troll who lives under a bridge. You're like, do I really look like that? No, you don't, OK? But you look hideous like that. If you want to make yourself look amazing in a selfie, then you just do this. Right? It's not just out. It's out and up. The higher you go, the better you look. No, it's a fact. All the women in the room know this, right? Every time we take a selfie, yes, we do. Of course we do. You guys think that we all look like this? No, we wait for the perfect lighting. We're like doing 360 degrees. Oh, there, boom. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We got this. OK, so here's the deal. That's the deal. The higher you go, the better you look. I am not a skinny girl, but if you were to go on my Facebook page, you would swear I'm 30 pounds lighter than I actually am because I look skinny in all my selfies because I know how to do this. All right? So the problem is I'm limited by the length of my arm. I'm only 5 foot 7. My arm only goes so far. I need an extra 18 inches to really look as good as I want to look. So selfie stick, OK? Plus. That iconic, it's great for group shots, that iconic Ellen DeGeneres picture at the Academy Awards last year with all those people in it, that wasn't with Ellen holding her phone out like this and taking a group shot. That's with a selfie stick. My point isn't about this, though. My point isn't about selfies. My point is, why do we take selfies in the first place? So we can share them. Unless you're Kim Kardashian and you just like to look at yourself, we don't take selfies because we're narcissistic. We take selfies so that we're, we can share our moments. So I take a selfie with you, boom, it's on Instagram. I take a selfie with you, boom, it's on Facebook. I take a selfie with you, boom, I text it to him. We're sharing our lives and our moments. That is the trend. The fad is selfie sticks. It's a goofy gadget. But it's indicative of a larger trend. Pay attention to trends. And be fearless. I think this is the hardest thing in business. Because if business is going great, then why would you change anything and try anything new? Business is good. Whatever you're doing is working. When business is bad, ooh, then being fearless is even harder. Because what if we try something and we spend money on it and it doesn't work? And then we just blew our budget. Anybody here have a Harley? Anybody? What's wrong with you people? Nobody's got a motorcycle? That guy does. All right. So one guy in the back's got a motorcycle. You guys all know the brand, though, Harley. Harley's been in a world of hurting for the last few years because nobody needs a $50,000 motorcycle. It's a product of passion. It's a purchase of passion. Harley will tell you this. Furthermore, every, uh, their core audience has always been white, middle-aged, affluent, baby boomer men. And pretty much every white, middle-aged, affluent, baby boomer guy who ever wanted a Harley got one. And in fact, these guys are aging out. They're selling their bikes or storing their bikes. So Harley's starting to look at their core audience and go, this, this customer group is shrinking. What do we do? So they looked at young people, and they were like, no. Young people don't think Harley's cool. Because every time they see a Harley, there's some dude with a long gray ponytail on the back. And <laughs> that's not cool. That's dad. Right? <laughs> so then they were like, well, what about women? And sure enough, yes, there is a sizable group of women who have expressed interest in riding motorcycles. Harley wanted to cultivate them, so they thought, we're going to do this organically. We're going to teach women how to ride. And if we teach women how to ride, some of those women are going to fall in love with riding, and some will fall in love with Harley. So they offer free clinics at their dealerships on Saturdays, no pressure whatsoever. This is your chance to come learn how to ride if you have ever wanted to try riding a motorcycle. The class is taught by a woman, so I don't have to feel stupid about asking questions of another woman. The right size bikes, because as you may or may not know, some of those bikes for Harley, and I'm not exaggerating, weigh 900 pounds. The women weigh 140. They can't even lift them, so they get the right size bikes. They have a fashion show, because Harley is just as much about the apparel as it is about the bikes. Refreshments. Because we ladies don't go anywhere unless there's snacks, right? And in addition to all of that, in addition to the class taught by the woman, the right size bikes, the fashion show, the refreshments, they offer free pole dancing lessons. That guy drifted, but he's back. <laughs> seriously, seriously, he was kind of looking around all of a sudden. <laughs> Tell me about the pole dancing. Now, before I go any further, I want to be very, very clear, because I don't want you to think Kelly said we have to do pole dancing at our utility. No. No, Kelly said we have to do No. But here's what they found. Harley found that the kind of woman who wants a Harley, she is, in fact, a certain kind of woman. She is the kind of woman who likes extreme sports. She likes to try new things. She likes exhilaration 
and the thrill of doing something kind of extreme. She likes being outside. And from a personality standpoint, she is the kind of woman who does not take herself that seriously and she has a great sense of humor about herself. She is the kind of woman who would watch five minutes of pole dancing lessons and be like, let me up there, I'll show you how to do it. All right? So hopefully you can see why this is right for Harley. But look at my headline, be fearless. Harley is just as much of a bureaucratic organization as anything else. Corporate, you know, people stabbing each other in the back trying to get ahead. Imagine the guts that it took for someone at Harley to raise their hand in an internal meeting and go, I have an idea. Pole dancing at the dealerships, right? <laughs> people get shot for ideas like that in corporate America. Somebody had to have the guts, not only to have a great idea, but have the guts to speak up about it, and then somebody else in management had to have the guts not to kill it, because that's pretty weird. But it is single-handedly saving Harley's butt. Harley's fastest growing group of customers is women riders. Lastly, helping beats selling. Helping always beats selling. If you help me, you don't have to sell me at all. If you help me, I will do business with you. We were doing this focus group one time and a bunch of young people and one guy said something that just always really resonated with me and he said, you know, we don't need any more information. We have this thing called the internet, <laughs> but what we need is advice. And I particularly think this is true for the utility business. People are hungry for advice, they're hungry for what to do, they're hungry for how to do things right. So guide them. Guide them and you will retain your customers. So. Here's four things you can do right now. You can actively promote your community efforts and social involvement. You can hold a candid conversation with your associates about what they're hearing from customers, products, vendors, suppliers. Again, if you ask, they'll tell you. You can identify at least two pilot fish all around you and start an ongoing dialogue with them. It's not one and done. Start an ongoing dialogue. And make sure that your social media platforms are up to date and active and post relevant articles that help people. Nothing's worse than a, 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 a Facebook page that was last updated in August of 2013. Right? So, wrapping up, my final thoughts. You can't control the stock market. You can't control the economy. You can't even control the cost of goods and labor. None of that is in your control. But the thing that matters most is totally in your control, and that's the customer experience. And that's the most important thing of all. That is how people feel the love. Now, when Sherilyn introduced me, she mentioned my book. Uh, it's called Crafting the Customer Experience for People Not Like You. It's awesome. <laughs> now, all kidding aside, I was number five on the list of the best-selling business books for the year that it was published a couple years ago. I'm going to be around all morning till about 11 o'clock. Come see me at the break if you want a book. If you get a book that's by a best-selling author and it's a best-selling book and it's signed, then you know that sucker's worth a million dollars on eBay when you go to resell it, right? So thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
This concludes our opening session, but before you leave, one more round of applause for the Los Angeles County High School for Arts Vocal Jazz Ensemble. Thank you guys. Have a great day here at ITRON Utility Week.